All right, folks. Um, so I guess I'm ready to get started. We're at 1.30 now. Yeah, that's great. Now this time you can be quiet and all stare at me. Mm -hmm. um, okay, never mind. Peace out. <laughs> Um, so I'm Jonathan Eric. I'm a member of the Xbox research team, and I'm here today to talk about how to di recruit more diverse participant pools for UR studies. Uh, so I'll be starting off today by talking about why it's important to recruit for diversity and the challenges of doing so. Uh, and then the core of my talk will be about a series of interviews I ran to better understood what drove participants to engage with recruitment ads on social media uh, using a sample that was d indexed to be diverse across gender, racial, and ethnic lines. And then I'll talk about the results of those interviews, um, three groups of responses I identified and what distinguished them from each other, and then some best, best practices for recruitment that come from that. Um, and then when I do so, I'll first be focusing on targeting diverse participants, and then I'll talk about persuading them. Um, and then just, I guess, one slight technical note is I have one screen here, which has my slides. Uh, this is exactly the problem I was about to mention. Um, and then I have a separate screen here that has my actual presenter notes. So if at some point it seems like I'm talking about something that's completely unrelated to what's actually on the screen, you're probably right, and somebody should just like wave their hand or throw something at my head, and I'll figure it out. Yeah, great, just like that. Mm -hmm. And so for both ethical and financial reasons, in games research, we have an imperative to help our teams reach the broadest possible audiences for their games. Um, and so to explain what I mean by that, I'm gonna start by talking about this stock image I found in Noodling the Interwebs. The name of this image, according to Canstock, is Diverse Team. And at the same time, I found it because I had done a Google search for the string groups of mostly white dudes. Uh, and that contradiction is sort of the problem we're trying to grapple with today. Uh, so this image is pitched as a representation of a diverse team. If you'd like, you can go to Canstock and pay $8 for it and remove the watermark. I'm happy to tell you where to find it. Um, and yeah, this diverse team is, I would say, about 71% white, just based on looking at them. Um, I can't speak for you, but there's exactly one member of the team that I read as being a woman. Um, but it might just be a dude with curly hair in the center there. It's hard to say. Um, none are femme presenting, right? Everyone's wearing an identical suit and tie. So overall, this diverse team is mostly white and mostly dudes. So games are trying to reach a broad, diverse global audience. But in practice, uh, a lot of our games are consistently reaching an audience that is mostly white and mostly dudes. And a fundamental part of a researcher's role is to help teams overcome their own internal biases uh, and understand the needs of players who are different from them. And frequently, you'll be shocked to hear that devs on our teams are also mostly white and mostly dudes. So a key tool to helping broaden the team's horizons is ensuring that UR studies are collecting data from participants that are actually representative of the potential audience for the game. And so when a game is trying to reach a broad audience, reachers should be recruiting from a population uh, and bringing in samples that represent a broad audience. Um, but historically, well, I can't speak for everyone in this room, but I know that we've often struggled in our attempts to do so. And as a result, it often ends up being the case that the samples for our studies are frequently still mostly white and mostly dudes. So here's a... Oh. Exactly what I'm talking about. Also, something definitely happened to my slides in the translation. Um, so let's pretend those are arrows pointed down. Uh, here's a super simple funnel model for participant sourcing. Uh, we recruit participants. They sign up for studies. We collect data from them. We get insights. So I'm only going to be talking about the first two steps of that funnel today, because one of the key limitations is the breadth at the top. Um, so historically, on the Xbox research team, part of the way we've, we've tried to solve the problem of diversity in our participant pool is just by treating it as a key performance indicator, a KPI. And so across the board, we just sort of apply a default requirement that studies need to meet a basic floor for diversity, uh, and that the sample should include at least 40% people who aren't male, so female, non-binary, another gender, and at least 20% people whose racial and ethnic background is not white. 
And then when the pandemic forced us to pivot to remote studies, there was a fair amount of like, hallelujah, this should solve the diversity problem, right? Mm -hmm. Historically, we've been limited to recruiting within the Seattle metro area, uh, which to be clear, if you have not actually gone out onto the street yet, is extremely white. And so by unlocking the ability to recruit participants from across the United States, this should solve the problem, right? Except that it didn't. And so part of the problem is, no matter how diverse the population you're trying to sample from is, you still have to convince the actual people in that population that they want to engage with your attempts at recruitment, that they want to sign up and participate in your studies. And so, yep. <laughs> Again, down arrows. And so by expanding the top of the funnel, what we want to do, we should be able to improve the diversity and quality of the participant pool every step along the way, at least hopefully, and thereby ensure our ability to deliver a quality sample that is a truly diverse representation of the game's potential audience. OK, that sounds good, right? So how do we figure out how to do that? So as a starting point, I just asked people, um, so to improve our understanding of recruitment processes for potential participants from historically underrepresented backgrounds, um, I started with something simple. I ran a series of unmoderated interviews on user testing. Um, this is a great tool uh, that allows you to run like quick super studies where you can just sort of find out what sort of participant you're looking for, run them through some you can either set them up for moderated interviews where you actually get to talk back and forth, or you can even just do some high throughput unmoderated interviews where you just show them some stimuli, let them talk to their heart's content, and then get to watch a lot of videos later. And so participants were recruited for two separate studies. Um, there were 29 participants who played video games for at least a couple hours a week on console, and 30 participants who played the same amount on PC. Each sample was crafted to be full of the sorts of players who have the sorts of gameplay experience that would make them qualify for what I sort of think of as a typical games research study. Well, at the same time, I was trying to index strongly on diversity. So 42% of the overall sample were women and 50% men. 10% um, of the sample were non-binary or another gender. And 10% were transgender. And then similarly, we aim to make sure that the sample had a floor of at least 8% uh, belonging to each of the major, major racial or ethnic groups that we track in our recruitment and sample metrics. Um, and those numbers on the bottom might look a little weird, and just to be clear, uh, so on user testing, they give us some basic demographic data about all of our participants, which includes gender. Their basic demographic information does not include race. Sorry, only no racial and ethnic information for the people that I was trying to recruit specifically on that. And I didn't want to get so detailed about micromanaging my participant pool that I was declaring like the specific racial composition of every single human being in it. I just wanted to make sure we had to hit a floor. And so this is what our floor looks like. And then the other half of the participants I can't really speak to. So each participant was then asked to evaluate an assortment of recruitment ads that we were graciously allowed to use by two recruitment agencies we work with, uh, User Research Solutions at Experis and uh, User Research International, or URI. In each case, the ads had been posted on social media and were actual ads that had been used to recruit participants for real Xbox research studies prior to their use in my interviews. Uh, console players were shown a series of six recruitment ads that had been used to recruit console players. PC players were shown a series of five recruitment ads that have been used to recruit PC players. And then uh, I'll just note that one of these ads, the third one on the top and the first one on the bottom, were the same because they've been used to re recruit a mixed pool. Um, oh, and an apology in advance. Um, all of the ads are screenshots that were just taken from the social media campaign and then sh thrown in a Word document and sent to me. So they look great if you're reading them on a screen that is like a foot in front of your face. Uh, and you're probably going to see a fair amount of pixelation and struggle to read some microtext um, if you're actually in the room trying to look at them on the screen. Uh, so participants were asked to explain their answers to four questions about each ad. Um, what are your initial impressions? Would you try to participate in this study? 
what type of person do you think this ad is trying to recruit? And then finally, do you think this ad is trying to recruit people like you? Um, and what I found out was at the highest level, the first major finding was that participants' decision making followed a simple mental model. So I did ask the participants whether they might participate in a given study before I asked them who it was targeting or whether it was targeting them. Um, but when making the decision, they just consistently flipped that script around and followed a funnel. From their perspective, the first question they needed to think about was, do I think the study is targeting people like me? And then if the answer to that question was yes, then the next question is, am I confident that it feels worth my time to engage with this ad? And so consistent with this, participant answers to the questions uh, would you try to participate in the study, and do you think this ad is trying to recruit people like you were closely aligned? Participants gave the same answer to each question 82% um, of the time when just looking across all of the interviews. And then um, for every single ad we had them review, a majority of participants gave the same answer to each question. So next, I'm going to start talking about what we learned about targeting participants from this. So three groups emerged from the patterns of participant response. Um, for the first one, it's a group that the question, is this targeting me, is a question that's fairly easy to answer. This is a group of self-identified gamers. These are participants who tended to think in very general terms and needed very little convincing as a result. The study was looking for gamers, and they were a gamer, so it was obviously looking for people like them. Uh, you probably won't be surprised to hear that this group was disproportionately white and disproportionately male. And then there was a second group of that I called hesitators. Um, so some participants required active convincing because they didn't expect to be included in umbrella categories like a gamer, um, just kind of by default. Their default state was frequently an assumption that a study did not target them. Uh, and they often required explicit reassurance that it was or that it might be. I love the coffee dramatic pauses. I hope you're enjoying them too. And then finally, we've got a group that kind of lands in the middle between those two, uh, a group of serious, very serious PC gamers. Um, so this is a subset of participants who were specifically from that PC uh, interview, series of interviews, um, and they kind of fell between the other groups. Most of the time, they assumed they were probably part of the ad's target and would pr participate in a study, but they were particularly excited for the ads that seemed more authentically PC or more aimed at more serious gamers, and they were sometimes a bit skeptical at the ones that weren't obviously aimed at PC players or didn't seem to be authentically PC enough for them. Um, and so that sometimes meant they were a little bit at conflict with hesitators, because these PC gamers would tend to index more on the ads that the hesitators found a little more excluding. And so diving into these groups in a little more depth, the hesitators tended to assume that they would be rejected out of hand for a study. Um, and this was often based on their experiences with a history of exclusion in other contexts, sometimes similar contexts, sometimes other studies they talked about applying for. And as a result, it didn't seem worth the effort to even apply. Even when they decided that they would try to participate in a study, they would just often resign themselves to just defeat in advance. Um, in general, these participants were members of the groups that are historically underrepresented within gaming, and so they weren't often tenuously attached to the idea of being a gamer. And then as such, they would deliver a wide range of reasons why they didn't expect to qualify for a study. This included their gender, their ethnicity, their age, not playing enough games, not playing the right type of games. You know, they play a lot of games, but they don't play enough of them, right? And just to say it out loud, as I mentioned before, all of these participants, like in order to participate in the study, they had to have the sorts of experiences that meant they would be excellent candidates um, for a wide variety of our studies. But they, they were convinced that they weren't, even dismissing themselves as someone who just played video games for a couple hours every day. Um, 
And that's because even when they couched it in terms about their gameplay preferences or experiences, what they were still internalizing and talking about was an aspect of their identity. Um, and so as I said, they frequently started from this assumption that they were excluded by default. Um, but the language and imagery used in the recruitment ads would sometimes even reinforce that idea further, um, giving them the idea that they wouldn't be a good fit for this kind of study. And some examples of what that looks like. So some calls to action were interpreted as intimidating to people who felt found themselves less committed as players or as gamers. Um, these calls to action had phrases like, video games are your passion and share your passion by shaping the future of game design. And they just kind of go like, I, I like video games. It's not really my passion. I don't know that I want to shape the future of game design. That seems like work. That seems like a little bit much to ask me for. I'm just somebody who likes to play Assassin's Creed, right? Um, and then others felt aimed at specific groups, even when they weren't necessarily. Um, with phrases like, pull the triggers and set your keybinds, PC players. Um, sometimes the word gamer was just a trigger in and of itself. People would be like, I'm not a gamer, I just play games, right? Um, and they sometimes had similar responses to images that focused on white men, um, particularly if it was portrayed in sort of a stereotypical gamer context or the person themselves looked like a bit of a walking stereotype. Um, and part of this is that it reinforced that idea of not me, right? You're looking for that guy. You're not looking for me. But sometimes it also just reinforced the idea that the sorts of people the study were recruiting for was the sort of person they wanted to avoid. Um, you know, both in terms of things like, well, I don't want to have to hang out with a bunch of dude bros if I go in for this study. But also, like, I don't really think of my identity as one that I would share with a bunch of dude bros like that. That's clearly a different kind of person than I am. And so, although hesitators did tend to require active reassurance, the good news is that they didn't need much. These participants frequently recognized imagery of diverse participants, thank you, um, as a good faith attempt at, at proactive inclusion, which convinced them that the ad had a broader target audience. This was the case even if the participant was not a member of the group actually being presented in the image. We see here a fairly subtle one of just a woman's hand holding the controller. And we see men of color uh, responding to that and just being like, well, yeah, it seems like they're looking for someone different. They're not looking for the usual white dude. And that enough is enough to encourage them that they might be targeted by an ad like this. Self-identified gamers, to be clear, also often recognize these images as, as that sort of proactive attempt at inclusion. They just didn't really care. So even in cases where they thought an ad was trying to recruit a specific demographic that didn't include them, this didn't really impact their decision to participate in a study because they just still assumed they would qualify for it. Um, hesitators were also easily convinced by messaging that suggested the study was looking to recruit all types of people that play games. So successful examples either explicitly suggested interest in a broad audience, um, Ba, 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 lost my place, or explicitly dismissed the participants' fears. Successful examples included language that was focused on broad interest in games, like no matter where you play your games, your feedback could be exactly what researchers are hoping for. Um, and they were also inspired by calls to action that explicitly framed around broadening audiences, like want to help create a more engaging experience for a wider audience. No matter what type of game you play, your insight can help make games more enjoyable for everyone. Um, and those sorts of diverse photos and inclusive framings tended to be purely beneficial for most of the ads shown, but sometimes they went a little too far. They got a little too broad and they got a little too vague. Um, and so we saw phrases like calling all gamers and if you play video games at least once a week, um, that doesn't really look like it's actually looking for a specific group of people at that point and it just kind of sounds generic and then leave some with lacking clarity as to what the studies were looking for. This was particularly true for the participants who identified as PC players. Um, so the participants who identified as PC gamers or serious gamers sometimes also needed a convincing that a study was for them. Although they tended to assume a study was trying to recruit people like them by default, they were more hesitant if the ad didn't reassure them it was specifically looking for PC players um, as opposed to console players. 
And so similar to hesitators, they didn't need much to be convinced. Pictures of PC hardware or specifying PT in the text usually seemed to be sufficient. But even then, their comments were clearly more excited if an ad used language or depicted hardware that was more consistent with what they thought real PC players would use. As a result, the two samples featuring photos of PC hardware were most frequently selected as ads participants felt most like attempts to recruit someone like themselves. But on the margins, this sometimes set those hardcore, serious PC gamers in opposition to hesitators. So for the ad on the left, some of these serious PC gamers called out the image of a man playing on a laptop as unrealistic. No one ever plays games on the couch. No one plays games on a laptop like that. Well, a few hesitators immediately go, oh, this feels genuine. This feels like a real world gaming scenario. Um, and then we see the image on the right where hardcore PC gamers are seeing the neon backlighting and the set your keybinds language. And that convinces them that it's for real serious PC gamers. Um, and so as a result, men selected this as the image that felt most like it was trying to recruit people like them. However, hesitators felt excluded for the same reasons. And consistent with that, uh, it was most frequently selected by women as the ad that felt least like it was trying to recruit someone like them. Uh, so now we're already past our time, but I'm still going to do a quick dive into the second step of the funnel because we have plenty of time for Q&A. So in trying to decide whether it would be worth their time to engage with an ad, far and away th the biggest fact, oh, thank you. Uh, far and away the biggest factor for memories of every single group was also the simplest. They wanted money. Participants felt confident that a study was targeting them and they, they would be paid a reasonable amount of money for a reasonable investment, then they would generally try to participate in the study. So as a result, if an ad didn't include any information about incentive, participants tended to assume it was just looking for free labor. Um, they sometimes framed their interest around opportunities to take part in research or provide feedback, but this was just kind of something they were talking about as an added side benefit. It wasn't the real reason they would want to participate in a study. Most participants expected the ads to provide clear, concrete details that they would, could leverage to determine their interest in a study. In addition to being useful, these granular details also helped convince participants that the ads were legitimate. Uh, and so these details are things like a concrete, specific incentive, um, actual length of sessions, the actual dates of the actual sessions, the session locations for our studies. This was generally remote or Redmond. Uh, a link participants could connect to a real, honest-to-God company, like ExparisUserResearch.com. Um, and then links that were tied to concrete words. Um, so when we're talking about like tiny URL type links, things that are linked to concrete words and not just random alphanumeric sequences. So like bit.ly slash biome gaming, not bit.ly slash 2A6NZCW. Um, and the fact link, as one that I'll call out, is particularly interesting because participants frequently stated that their time was valuable. And they never really gave me the impression that they intended to click on a link and actually read a fact. Um, they just didn't intend to go to as far as like clicking through to the link without first being convinced that the link was going to open something that was real. And so by seeing this link to a fact next to the link they click on to recruit for the study, they're like, oh, OK, experience user Research, that seems like a real company in a real place somewhere I could find some information about. I don't need to find out that information. I know it exists. That's the piece I needed. Done. I can click on the link now. Or I can click on the link to uh, sign up for a study now. Um, and so, boop, boop, boop. Um, but participants frequently viewed this ad language with a skeptical lens. And some assumed that ads were trying to trick them by default because they are alive and live in America. <laughs> um, and so particularly in cases where the uh, language seemed vague or cagey. And this is one of the clearer examples in this regard. You know, so there's some language here that is way too small for you to read, but it says that the incentive is up to $200. Um, and they see this and assume that this meant that they would get no dollars or very few dollars, right? Um, a few participants took this a step further, and they noticed that 
um, some of the studies were over multiple days, because if you're running usability, you can't run every participant on a single day. But they go, oh, September 9th to 22nd. This, I would have to be signing up for four days of research, and I might get $200 at the end of it. What's the point? Um, and so when they encountered this type of vagueness, it frequently just assumed it wouldn't be worth more time to try to get more details. They're just writing it off. Um, in extreme cases, skepticism resulted in concerns that ads might be scams that they wanted to actively avoid, particularly in cases where vagueness about the incentive or study were paired with calls to action that just sounded too good to be true. Like, once again, going back to shape the future of game design. It's like, really? You got me coming in for an hour to play a game and I'm going to shape the future of game design? Maybe not. Um, and so we had four themes in participant comments about the ads that made them suspicious lack of concrete info about the study or incentive, lack of a clear connection to a company or product in the text of the ad. Um, and this is, you know, these are basically, you'll notice the reverse of what we saw on the last slide. Um, there's some amount of, I know it when I see it, you know, so some part times participants would be like, this looks like the sort of ad you see at the bottom of a news article where everyone knows their spam and no one knows what it's really for. Um, and because of some combination of like the generic seeming stock photos or some of them having maybe more of an unprofessional appearance or just like the fonts that didn't look quite right. Um, and again, that was sorts of vague or unrealistic calls to action that seemed too good to be true. And so to close, I'm just going to quick summarize the findings from this study um, and quick, then quick talk through some best practices based on these findings. So the most successful ads hit on both counts. Uh, they had imagery or calls to action that assured participants they were included in the potential audience that were then paired with concrete details about incentives, the recruiting agency, the study itself. So we have one here, has clearly inclusive imagery, um, has language that participants called out as inclusive no matter where you play your games. Your feedback could be, your feedback could be exactly what researchers are looking for. Also does a good job of having clear, concrete details that are reassuring. It's got a bit.ly link that includes a real word in it, which is Izzy Gaming. Um, it's got dates for sessions. It specifies that they're two hours. They're in Redmond. You get $100. Um, by contrast, the least successful ads usually fail to hit the mark. Well, all of the least successful ads fail to hit the mark in at least one of these counts. Um, so we've got one here that's uh, not great on recruiting or on uh, targeting. You know, it's like if you play video games regularly, and some people found that reassuring, right? Some of those hesitators are like, well, I play video games regularly, but a lot of people just found that too vague to actually feel inclusive. Um, and then on the, on the persuasion side, it just completely lacked concrete details. Uh, all they say about incentive is that they pay in actual US dollars. Uh, which somehow failed to reassure people that they were actually going to get paid at the end of the study. <laughs> um, when they see the bit.ly link with the random string didn't feel safe, stuff like that. Um, okay, and so to close, uh, some quick best practices for targeting uh, diverse video game players. Consider leveraging images of diverse video game players, um, people who don't just look like white dudes. Um, consider language that's exclusive because it's explicitly framing as itself as looking for a broad audience or trying to dismiss participant fears about the type of person or feedback the study's looking for. Um, for any study that includes PC players as potential participants, consider ways to just explicitly say PC in the ad. Um, and for PC specifically, it might be worth thinking about approaches that involve taking separate ad or sets of separate ads for studies. And if you want to have some serious PC gamers, you may just want to have some imagery that's going to be more reassuring to them. Your neon backlit $5,000 rigs. Uh, and then for kind of the rest of us over in the plebs, um, you can get a little more shitty battle station depictions. There's people sitting around with a laptop. Um, things to avoid. Um, language that implies participants need real passion, real expertise, that they need to really care about this to participate in the study. Um, consider avoiding the term gamer altogether, or language that might jump out to some people as stereotypically bro, like pull the triggers. 
Um, consider fo avoiding images focused on white men unless you're making sure to pair that with inclusive language. Um, and then the language issues might be a bit subtle, but consider ways to just avoid it being so broad that it turns into vague and generic. Uh, and then for persuasion, um, consider ways to communicate clear, concrete commitments to incentive amounts without caveats, without potential loopholes. Just put your money on the table and be like, $200, it's yours, right? Um, clear, concrete details about study opportunities as much as you can, you know, if this is a post on Twitter. Um, concrete references to, uh, well, I was talking about Experis here, but just in general, concrete references to you, to your recruitment firm, to whoever you can actually connect this to. Uh, the important part here is just to make sure that it could, it's a way they can connect to believe like, oh, there's a way to understand there's a real company here. There's a real human being behind this post. This isn't being posted by a bot that's trying to steal all my information and my bank account. Um, URLs, if you have to do tiny URLs or things like that, um, just make sure that they include like real words, concrete terms. They don't have to be real words that make sense. All of the one examples I shared were like weird code words. And let me tell you, if someone actually decided to Google tugboat gaming, they did not find the game where they were going to play in that study. Um, language about participating in research or opportunities to give feedback are helpful on the margin because they give context for what we're asking them to do and reassuring that they're legitimate research opportunities. But they don't really seem to be much in the way of big motivators in and of themselves. Um, and then consider avoiding incentive, phrase, incentive phrasing that may seem overly vague or cagey. Um, for studies across multiple days, you might want to think about ways to make sure to clarify, like, we're only asking for you to come in one day, or we are actually asking you to come in all weekend as relevant. Um, and then consider just ways to make sure that your ads don't look like they're scams. Um, you know, images, avoiding images that are really obviously stock photos um, or calls to action that are just unrealistic and hyperbolic. Um, so on that note, I've actually made it all the way to the end. Um, I'd like to thank everyone on the Xbox research team for helping this out. And then I'd particularly like to help our partners at um, Xperis, URS, and URI for helping out with the stimuli for this study. We don't have 15 minutes left for questions, according to the schedule. A break for 15 uh, after the 15 minutes we have left for Q&A on the schedule. The next talk's at 2.30. Uh, the question is, if I recommend these particular vendors for recruiting the Seattle area, um, I'm going to say that that's not a question I feel great answering one way or the other. I'm, I don't work closely enough with any specific group to say that I can uh, give recommendations about where you should spend your money. Uh, we have a question on Discord. Oh, yeah. What are my thoughts on how Gamergate has shifted my uh, their people's understanding of the term gamer? Um, I could go for a very long time talking about negative polarization and its broader impact on our society over the last decade, but that might be a little bit of a rabbit hole. Um, I think we're kind of seeing the problem here, right? Is like gamer is a term that has a meaning associated with it in our culture. Um, some people want to define that in specific ways, and I think there's a, is to some extent fighting over what the term means, but most of the participants aren't involved in that fight. They're not coming at this with any sort of analytical lens. They're just kind of going like, this is what the word means to me, right? And some people will have a positive association with that. 
Some people may have sort of a reclaiming approach to that of like, well, you know, maybe some people think I'm not a gamer, but I definitely am a gamer, and I want to make sure they understand that. And other people will just be like, uh, that's, that's not me. The image that is coming to mind here isn't me, and it doesn't matter that I spend, you know, 15 hours a week playing Call of Duty. I'm still not a gamer because I'm not a part of that culture. That's a very good question. Um, so the question was, did the images in any of the ads make the participants feel pandered to? The reason that's a good question is, honestly, I'm trying to think of the responses I looked at. What I can say is that definitely was not a pattern in any of the responses, because um, if so, if there would have been a slide on that for sure. Um, like, I think, you know, I think to a certain extent, I can easily see people being patterned to, and I'm sure that wasn't that it wasn't something that happened zero percent of the time. But on net, it was more reassuring because it, like, even to the extent that they went like, "Well, they're obviously putting this here because they want someone like me to sign up for the study." You know, it's the difference between going like, "Well, I don't know if they want someone." To participate, like me to participate in the study or not, and then being like, oh, well, now I know the answer to that question. Right? So even if there's a negative aspect of the pandering itself, the net result is still going like, okay, I am, be I am the person being pandered to, and that is useful information to have. In the back? You're, you're the one in the back, you're fine. Yep. So the question is, if I'm looking for women who are serious PC gamers, or maybe even more broadly, like hesitators, who I think are still seriously PC gamers, yeah. Um, and so I think, so that's complicated. So I think one, it kind of goes, of, there's a question of like, are you looking micro or macro here, right? So if you're going macro, and you're like, I want to make sure that this profile has women, I want to make sure it has serious PC gamers, I want to make sure it's everyone who plays games on PC, I think your strategy is to go broad and try some different ads. And I talked about that a slide or two back, you know, the idea of like, here's an ad that we think will get women to engage with it, here's an ad that we think will get serious PC gamers to engage with it. Um, if you're looking specifically for women who are PC gamers, like serious PC gamers, and you're not looking for anyone else, then I would suggest just being really concrete and specific about that. And it's like, are you a woman? Have you spent $2,000 building a liquid nitrogen cooled gaming rig? You, we want you. <laughs> Everybody else go home. Um, you know, if you're looking for a serious PC gamer segment, and you're like, no, we want the hardcore PC gamers, but we want to make sure we're getting like everyone. That's where I kind of go, I don't know. <laughs> Get inventive. Uh, Discord? All right. Any difference in, in participant show rates? Like how often they activate yeah. them? Yeah. Um, I don't actually know the answer to that one. I can say that like, since we've started using these guidelines, uh, we've improved our ability to bring participants into the lab in general, um, or the diversity of the pool of participants we're bringing in the lab in general. I couldn't tell you what the delta is at all between like the people we're recruiting and who's actually walking in the door. I just haven't thought to even look at that data yet. Um, I think the great thing about a database is you can run any ad you want uh, to bring people into the database, right? Um, and so the focus there should be on like diversity and breadth and making sure you have a database that 
has wide ranging, covers the sorts of needs you might have for a study, um, that you anticipate having needing for a study, and that you are not, one, that the database doesn't index hugely on any one group, and also that your uh, sample of any one group is large enough that you can keep going back to the well, right? It's one thing to be like, well, our database has five women, so we are set for this usability study. A week from now, we're screwed, right? Um, I think I saw a hand. Um, so I'll be honest that that's just not a lens I was really paying attention to when I was running this study. Um, and so I literally have no idea if anyone talked about it or not because I forgot about it the moment they t were done talking about it. I don't know. Yeah, that's uh, kind of outside the bounds of what I've looked at. We have a Discord. Uh, how's it, if you implemented these practices, how is it going? Um, I don't have super granular numbers, but what I can say is that in general, like, um, I don't think we are hitting our targets 100% of the time on a regular basis, but uh, we are doing better than they were before. So it's kind of still, still a journey, still trying to figure out ways we can do things even better than we are now. But um, we've definitely have been able to improve our, the diversity of our pool over the last year or so since we started this project. All right, I don't see any more hands. And we've got three minutes, or we can be good. All right, I'm putting the mic down now. <laughs> 